Hello and welcome to the University of Alberta's Opening Up Copyright Instructional Module on Applying Fair Dealing. Step right up! Do you want to know the answer to almost every question about whether you can lawfully use a copyright protected work? Get ready! It depends! <laughs> okay, so it, it depends, but depends on what? There are many different exceptions in the Copyright Act, but the most important and arguably the most commonly used one is fair dealing. Fair dealing is a statutory right that allows for the reproduction and use of copyright protected works for certain purposes without requiring permission, provided that the dealing is fair. The purpose of fair dealing is to balance the exclusive rights of copyright owners with the rights of users to make use of the works where that use is in the public interest. Most Canadians use this legal breathing space <sighs> daily without even knowing it. It is also considered a safeguard for freedom of expression. Over a century of Canadian and UK legislation and jurisprudence have shaped how fair dealing is applied in Canada. So how can you determine if you can use something under fair dealing? There is a two-step test for assessing whether a particular use of some or all of a copyright protected work might reasonably count as fair dealing. The first step is determining whether the use is eligible to be considered for fair dealing. This is done by assessing the purpose of use. Section 29 of the Copyright Act lists five purposes. Research, private study, education, parody, and satire. The use of a copyright protected material for any of these purposes will not infringe copyright if the use is accepted by the rights holder or determined by a court of law to be fair. The Act identifies three additional purposes for which fair dealing might also apply. These are criticism or review and news reporting. These are separated from the initial list of five because they carry the additional requirement of including proper attribution when used. Just meeting one of the purposes in the first step doesn't mean the use is fair. It depends on the outcome of the second step, the six-factor test. The first step makes it clear that if your use falls outside of the eight purposes, then you cannot rely on fair dealing. However, it is important to note that the eight purposes are intended to be considered broadly. For example, listening to short previews of music before purchasing is considered research. The Supreme Court has noted that, in mandating a generous interpretation of the fair dealing purposes, including research, the court and CCH created a relatively low threshold for the first step so that the analytical heavy hitting is done in determining whether a dealing was fair. So what does this analytical heavy hitting look like? The six-factor test is used to assess whether the use of a work can reasonably be considered as fair. The six factors are the purpose of the dealing, the character of the dealing, the amount of the dealing, alternatives to the dealing, the nature of the work, and the effect of the dealing. It is important to recognize that not all factors will apply in all cases, and the factors do not need to be equally weighted. These factors are simply a guide to making an interpretation of whether a dealing should ultimately be considered to be fair. The Supreme Court also noted that in future cases, other factors beyond these six may be considered. So how do you apply the six factors? Fortunately, the Supreme Court in three fair dealing cases, CCH, SOCAN, and Alberta Education, has provided some guidelines on how to understand and apply the factors. With regard to the purpose of the dealing, the court in CCH stressed that users' real motive should be considered and added that, for example, research done for a commercial purpose may not be as fair as research done for a charitable purpose. In the SOCAN case, the High Court noted that safeguards, such as only allowing users to stream 30-second music previews, as opposed to allowing the previews to be downloaded, should be considered under purpose. The character of the dealing factor examines how works were dealt with. If multiple copies are made, and then widely distributed, this will tend toward unfairness. If a work is destroyed after it is used, this may tend toward fairness. And importantly, custom or practice in a particular trade or industry is also considered. It is also important to identify who the user is when looking at all the factors, including character. For example, in the Alberta case, while teachers may have been making copies for their class, 
It is the student's perspective as the ultimate user that must be considered, and thus such copying should properly be seen as an individual copy for each student. The amount of the dealing factor deals with the proportion of the work copied, not the total number of copies made, which is considered under the character of the dealing factor. While copying a greater proportion of a work may tend toward unfairness, the Supreme Court has noted that in some cases an entire work can be copied fairly. The character and purpose of the dealing might also be considered in relation to amount. Thus, for example, it may be necessary for research or private study to copy the entirety of an academic article or court decision, but not to copy an entire literary work for the purpose of criticism or review. As the name implies, the alternative factor considers what alternatives to the dealing might have been used. If a non-copyright protected equivalent could have been used to achieve the same purpose, this tends toward unfairness. An important element in weighing the alternatives is the extent to which the copying or dealing was necessary to achieve the ultimate purpose. The nature of the work centers on the relationship between the copied work and its distribution. Copying a confidential work is less fair, although copying an unpublished work may be more fair if the copying is acknowledged and potentially leads to a wider public dissemination of that work. Finally, the effect of the dealing on the work considers to what degree the copies made compete with and adversely impact the market for the original work. Obviously, if the intended distribution of copies diminishes the market for a work, this will tend toward unfairness. But if the copying may increase the market for a work, such as the offering of music previews in the SOCAN case, this may tend toward fairness. It is important to remember that the final decision on fairness involves thinking of all six factors and how they relate to each other. There is no simple scorecard such as, if three factors are considered more fair, then the dealing is fair. If you want more details on how these factors were applied in each of the three Supreme Court cases, please have a look at the specific modules. In addition, there are many good supplementary resources, such as those from the Universities of Alberta, Ottawa, and Toronto, as well as the Canadian Association of University Teachers Copyright Guidelines, all of which can help in applying fair dealing. Given that fair dealing is, at its root, a determination of fairness made on a specific set of facts, and given that those facts and fairness itself are subject to interpretation, determinations of fair dealing may always be contentious. However, the way fair dealing is interpreted will remain a key element in preserving the balance of rights that is at the core of copyright law. Since the application of the two-step test involves a number of interpretations, in many cases no ultimate determination of whether a use is truly fair dealing can be made until it has been reviewed and decided by a court. Therefore, there can often be an element of uncertainty, and such uncertainty can have a chilling effect encouraging risk-averse institutions to be very conservative in their interpretation and application of fair dealing. Overly conservative applications of fair dealing can impact general practice within a sector, and when such practices become long established, these practices could become the standards against which interpretations of fairness are made. It may be that in practice, interpreting fair dealing too narrowly could over time lead to a narrowing of what dealings are considered to be fair, from that perspective, users' rights may be better maintained and protected through their being applied to the fullest reasonable extent. You should now be able to recognize that satisfying a fair dealing purpose fulfills only the first step of the two-step fair dealing test, understand the six factors and their relationship to one another in the second part of the two-step fair dealing test, and apply both steps of the fair dealing test to conduct a fair dealing analysis. This has been the University of Alberta's Opening Up Copyright Instructional Module on Applying Fair Dealing. Thank you for your attention.